Okay, on to the next question. Andrea Curlin asks, I would like to hear your thoughts on some of the fad diets that have been circulating. Paleo, ketogenic, vegetarian. Advocates of each of these often claim that their diet is the best for inflammation, yet they are all different. I think there are benefits to the perspectives that are brought by each of these various philosophies, though there might be contexts that make one or another make more sense. I personally choose a more middle-of-the-road route and eat what might be loosely termed a paleo-ish type of diet. The good news is that some of these diets have aims that sort of overlap with one another. For example, both paleo and ketogenic style diets emphasize cutting out refined carbohydrates and refined sugar, which in and of itself has a dramatic effect on lowering inflammation, lowering cancer risk, cardiovascular disease risk, dementia risk, and delays aging, all of which we talked about in more detail a minute ago when discussing how cutting out refined sugar is one of the big changes a person can make to have a rapid impact on personal health. The paleo diet, in contrast to some of the popular culture's flavors of keto emphasizes eating a lot of vegetables and fruits, which also comes with the package in vegetarian diets as well. As I mentioned earlier, fruits and particularly vegetables are a great source of micronutrients and other important compounds such as folate, magnesium, vitamin K1, calcium, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, potassium, lutein, zeaxanthin, terostilabine, anthocyanins, and other polyphenols and flavanols. I already mentioned how incredibly important these micronutrients are, how 22% of all enzymes require some micronutrient to work properly, and how important they are for metabolism, mitochondrial function, neurotransmitter production, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory pathways ways, immune function, brain function, repair enzymes, basically everything important for preventing disease and healthy aging. One of the problems with certain variations of the ketogenic diet is that without a great deal of care to avoid this pitfall, it can lead to inadequacies or deficiencies in some of these micronutrients, and you may not get as many of the other beneficial compounds present in plants as well. A great example of this might be the flavanols in blueberries, just by way of example. Fruits and vegetables, which again, it seems the paleo diet and vegetarian diet focus a bit more on, are also a great source of various types of fiber, including fermentable fiber and non-fermentable fiber. Fiber is not a single nutrient, which is why fiber supplements are no magic bullet either. It's not just about quantity, but also diversity of complex carbohydrates. There are hundreds of different polysaccharides, which are complex carbohydrates in plants. Gut microbes reflect this same diversity, specializing in using different types of complex carbohydrates and even the metabolic byproducts of the microbes. These microbes then produce short-chain fatty acids that impact our health in a variety of ways. This is why eating only one type of fiber, as in from supplementation, is ultimately a failed strategy. The best way to increase your microbial biodiversity is to actually eat a variety of polysaccharides from a diverse diet of plants and vegetables, as well as fruits. For example, lignins and cellulose, which are found in plant cell walls, are non-fermentable fiber that help move food and other byproducts through the intestines. Examples of fermentable fiber that are eaten by a wide variety of commensal bacteria in the gut include pectins, which are found in fruits and berries, gums, which are found in seeds, inulin, which are found in onions, garlic, artichoke, resistant starch, which is found in bananas and legumes. Green leafy vegetables also contain a prebiotic known as sulfoconovos, which also feeds beneficial gut bacteria in the gut. In addition to diversity, however, we also need volume of dietary fiber. Figuring out what this golden amount is to keep our microbes metabolically satisfied and not literally starving is tricky. The Institute of Medicine recommends men 50 years of age and younger get at least 38 grams of fiber per day, and women 50 years of age and younger get 35 grams of fiber per day. Those numbers drop slightly for adults older than 50. But traditional societies, for example, those that exist in places like Tanzania that are living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, can get around 200 grams of fiber, compared to the norm for U.S., which is shockingly only about 15 grams per day on average. Either by comparing to traditional societies or just taking the Institute of Medicine's recommendation, most people miss the mark. It is therefore important that whatever diet you do choose, you ultimately ensure your microbiome has adequate substrate, which survives digestion to make it toward the end of the digestive tract where the majority of these microorganisms live and interact with our immune systems and also our brains. The big problem with a low fiber diet, which in the context of this discussion may possibly be a version of the ketogenic diet, again, unless special care is taken, is that it may not provide this substrate. Fats, proteins, and sugar are all absorbed in the small intestine earlier on, but all of the hundreds of trillions of bacteria that are in our gut and regulate our immune systems, brain function, 
are more at the end or the distal part of our large intestine called the colon. When we eat fiber deficient foods, our gut microbes starve, but to keep from starving, they eat and cannibalize the gut barrier, which is made of carbohydrates and mucin. In terms of magnitude, low fiber has the largest negative effect on breaking down the gut barrier. Additionally, one study showed that a low fiber diet caused up to a 75% depletion in half of the gut bacterial species. That's a magnitude of effect that sounds almost on par with actually taking a round of antibiotics, if you think about it. Okay, so I voiced some real concerns about possible implementations of certain variations of ketogenic diets, but there are also many other benefits of a ketogenic diet. In my opinion, one of the main benefits from the ketogenic diet is a steady stream of ketone body production, particularly beta-hydroxybutyrate. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is a fascinating, mostly anti-inflammatory compound that also plays an antioxidant role as well. Altogether, most studies in animals link the production of beta-hydroxybutyrate to lower oxidative stress, lower inflammation, improvements in mitochondrial respiration and ATP production, and improved brain function. It also may change gene expression in a positive way by regulating class 2 histone deacetylases. As I mentioned earlier in another question, the ketogenic diet has also been shown to lower blood glucose levels and improve insulin sensitivity and lead to weight loss in some individuals. But this is not true for everyone, as some people do experience negative metabolic effects, likely due to genetic variation, which is why it may be helpful if you experiment with this diet to keep an eye on some of the blood biomarkers mentioned earlier to make sure that if you do experiment with it, you're not one of the folk that it may not be ideal for in the long term. It's also possible to ramp up ketone body projection for short bursts by kicking off evening fast a bit earlier, playing it strict and following some of the time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting protocols out there. Going back to the paleo and vegetarian diets, while they both focus on eating whole vegetables and fruits, they obviously differ in that vegetarian diets lack meat and have even heavier emphasis on plants, obviously. One potential drawback from the vegetarian diet is that people on this type of diet must put in a little more effort to get some of the micronutrients that are found in meat, such as the marine omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, iron, zinc, vitamin B12, selenium, for example. Iron, which in addition to being important for red blood cells to carry oxygen to all tissues, is also required to produce neurotransmitters and myelin. Non-meat sources of iron, such as kidney beans or lentil beans, contain iron that is bound to something called phytate. There are large bioavailability differences between iron that is in heme, which is how it is found in meat, compared to iron that is in phytate from a plant source. The bioavailability of iron in phytate is about 1.8 times lower than the iron in bioavailability from heme. The poor bioavailability of iron that is bound to phytate has to do with the fact that humans cannot digest phytate, so most of that iron does not get absorbed. For this reason, the RDA for iron for vegetarians should be 1.8 times higher. The RDA for adult males is about 8 milligrams a day, and for premenopausal women, about 18 milligrams a day. A lot of iron is lost during menstruation, which is why menstruating women are at high risk for deficiency in iron. In fact, approximately 16% of all menstruating women are iron deficient. Too much iron, however, can cause serious oxidative damage and other problems, which is why it's a good idea to get iron levels measured instead of blindly supplementing. This is just one example of what I mean by vegetarians having to work a little harder and think about the complexities like this to make sure they get all of their micronutrients. There are other examples. A great one I mentioned earlier are the omega-3 fatty acids. It may be tempting for vegetarians to just dose up on conventional plant sources like flaxseed, Some people have a gene polymorphism in a gene that encodes for the enzyme that converts the plant omega-3 ALA into EPA and DHA, the ones I refer to as marine omega-3 fatty acids a moment ago. And this can cause them to not convert as well as others. This can be circumvented by supplementing with something like microalgae oil and possibly eating higher concentrations of ALA, however. Or you may just be lucky and have a highly efficient converter of ALA, in which case it may not be a problem. Similarly, essential amino acids are much more abundant in meat and may be something that vegetarians may need to work a little harder to make sure they are getting enough of, particularly in older age. One study looking at people over 65 years of age found that there was an increased mortality rate with low protein intake, likely due to frailty. As I mentioned earlier, starting in middle age, we lose about 0.5 to 1% of muscle mass a year, and essential amino acids are important for maintaining muscle mass, along with putting those muscles to work, of course. But if you recall earlier, there may be a flip side to that. 
Folks on a paleo or keto diet do include meat. This means that they may need to take special care to be active and not sedentary to put that IGF-1 to use. Remember that eating meat increases IGF-1, and for people that have even one component of an unhealthy lifestyle, such as being sedentary, smoking or excessive drinking, or obesity, without trying to lose weight, for example, paleo and keto diets both have been shown to result in weight loss, this may increase all-cause mortality and cancer mortality. So that is my sort of high level general summary of these three diets. Like I said, I personally choose to try to get the best of all worlds. I eat paleo-ish, including fish and other meats, but with the big emphasis on plants that otherwise might be more common among vegetarian eaters. I am very vigilant about avoiding refined or processed foods, especially refined sugar. I practice time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting to get the occasional dose of the ketone body beta-hydroxybutyrate. I do not smoke or drink excessively. I make sure to exercise. This protocol works really well for me. But there may be life context, being honest to God sedentary, for example, or possibly even genetic backgrounds in which we need to emphasize one philosophy over the other. Similarly, a person might have an important clinical reason for pursuing a ketogenic diet, in which case avoiding pitfalls like poor micronutrient intake can become especially important. Either way, I think there's a rich future in figuring out where individual variation and genetic polymorphisms come into play in the pursuit of a healthy lifestyle, and conversely, what approaches are more broadly applicable, like time-restricted eating. 